Wat. I'm your host Tom Kearns and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Episode 11, Saints of Northumbria. We've now come to the start of what is called the Northumbrian Golden Age. This was a time of significant cultural and intellectual output, which emanated from Northumbria's churches and monasteries. Since this movement was primarily rooted in the ecclesiastical world of Northumbria, so it is necessary to set the scene of the culture and personalities that dominated Northumbria up to the start of the Golden Age. In this episode, we will look at four figures who collectively give us a sense of what the ecclesiastical world of Northumbria was like in the 7th century, and how the decisions of the Synod of Whitby facilitated the beginning of the Golden Age. These figures are Hild, Cadman, Cuthbert, and Benedict Bishop. The main themes of this episode are, one, how the cultural implications of the Synod of Whitby were not actually as severe as its political implications. Northumbrians were not especially wedded to their Irish ways, and were happy to adopt Roman customs while also maintaining some distinctively Irish traditions. And two, the importance of noble support in the maintenance of the ecclesiastical system, and how much this was balanced with genuinely sincere religious faith and Christianity's inherently egalitarian principles, which enabled people of non-noble background to leave their mark, even if this was somewhat rare. The first figure we'll be looking at is Hild, usually referred to as Hild of Whitby. She was a cousin of King Edwin, and was converted by Paulinus as a member of Edwin's court. She learned monasticism from Aidan, Bishop of Lindisfarne, and adopted Celtic customs. She founded Whitby as a double monastery along Celtic lines. By double monastery, I mean that Whitby was home to both monks and nuns who lived totally separate lives, but who worshipped together as a community. It was a style of monastery that is recorded by St John Cassian among the early desert monastics, but which in the West is most often associated with Irish monasticism through the work of Columbanus who founded several highly influential double monasteries on the continent in the 6th and 7th centuries. They emerged in Northumbria through a combination of Irish influence and emulation of continental custom. For example, Hild had originally planned to join the double monastery of Shells, but was prevented from doing so by the influence of Aidan, who introduced her to the monasticism of Lindisfarne. Hild, when she founded Whitby, followed a Gallic trend of noble women founding and leading double monasteries, since typically, as with Whitby, they were ruled by an abbess rather than an abbot, despite having a community of monks. The community continued to be a double monastery after the Synod of Whitby, despite this being a more Irish style of organisation, so there was no major change there. Prior to the Synod, Whitby had become a major monastery in Northumbria, and it continued to be a major ecclesiastical site afterwards, once Hild adopted the Roman customs that were endorsed by the gathered bishops. As a sign of its continued importance to the Northumbrian elite, Whitby also produced several bishops, and served as a place of retirement and burial for kings, including King Oswiu himself. Whitby was also home to Cadman, the first named poet in Anglo-Saxon history. He was a lay brother in the monastery, who worked caring for the animals. Bede tells us that one night, while the monks were drinking and singing songs, Cadman retired to bed early because he knew no songs himself. While sleeping, he had a dream in which an unidentified person told him to sing about the creation of the world. Cadman did so, and upon waking he recorded and expanded the poem. He took it to Hill, who after testing him to compose more poetry, allowed him to become a monk and live at Whitby, where he died in 684. His poem, Cadman's Hymn, is one of the most important pieces of verse in the entire English literary canon, since it is, as noted, the first poem that survives written in English. Thus, Cadman is an extremely important figure for the history of English literature generally, as well as the religious culture of Anglo-Saxon England. The story of Cadman also tells us something about Hild herself. She was a noble woman by birth and clearly friendly with the nobility, but Bede's image of her suggests humility and generosity for those less fortunate. Cadman, we are led to believe, worked with livestock and was not well educated. Thus the warmth with which Hill treated him suggests that she treated the poor and rich equally well. This must have been a sign of her sincere adherence to the gospel. 
Hill died in 680, and very quickly after her death, miracles were attributed to her, which led to her being recognised as a saint by the 8th century. Hild was succeeded as abbess of Whitby by Eanflad, widow of King Oswiu, which also demonstrates the close ties that Whitby had with the elite of Northumbria. Whitby itself, though, was destroyed by the Danes between 867 and 870, which also resulted in the destruction of many records relating to its history between Hild's death and the monastery's ruin, making its history in that period largely a mystery. After being sacked by the Danes, it was left completely abandoned until the Norman Conquest. Hild was only one saint to emanate from Lindisfarne. Even more famous than her was Cuthbert, who even today is something of a cultural icon in the northeast of England. Cuthbert was also a relative of nobility. He was born in the mid-630s in Dunbar, then a part of Northumbria, but now a part of Scotland. His conversion to Christianity is never explained, but he is presented by Bede as a pious Christian from a very young age. He was a soldier before entering Melrose as a monk. Melrose was founded by Aidan shortly before his death in 651 as a dependent house of Lindisfarne. After serving as a monk and priest in Melrose, Cuthbert was appointed to Ripon by Ulfrith, before the king expelled the Irish monks from that community in favour of Wilfred. Cuthbert quickly developed a reputation for charisma and miracle working. He also travelled widely, preaching and founding missions. Like Hild, he also accepted the decrees of the Synod of Whitby, and was tasked with implementing Whitby's decrees at Lindisfarne. In 676, he retired and took up the life of a hermit, moving finally to the remote island of Inner Farn, where he lived in solitude and prayer for many years. In 684, he was elected Bishop of Hexham, but was extremely reluctant to give up his hermit's life. It took, we're told by Bede in his Life of St Cuthbert, a large delegation, including King Edgefrith himself, to convince Cuthbert to take up his position, and even then, he chose to become Bishop of Lindisfarne rather than Hexham. He didn't serve as a bishop for very long, though, and went back into isolation on Inner Farn in 686, and died there in 687. He quickly became a saint, and Lindisfarne, where he was buried, became the focal point of his cult, which was one of the most influential and wealthiest in all of Anglo-Saxon England. It continued to be based on Lindisfarne until 875, when the monks there were forced to flee the island when Danes overran Northumbria. With Cuthbert's coffin and relics, the monks wandered between their various estates for seven years after their expulsion from Lindisfarne, before finally settling in Chesterley Street. They stayed there until 995, when they came into possession of land a few miles away on an easily defensible peninsula in the River Weir. They moved the coffin there and founded the church that would go on to become the heart of the city of Durham, where it is still today. The coffin's elaborate carvings and ornate contents demonstrate how wealthy the community of Cuthbert became due to his reputation as a miracle worker. Its extensive land holdings and its close ties to the nobility of Northumbria all also attest to this. Inside his coffin, when it was opened in 1104, there was a treasure trove of valuable goods, including a gospel book, an ornate cross, and vestments. The book, which is 5 by 4 inches in size, is the oldest surviving book binding in the West, and it contains a simple Latin text of the Gospel of John. The cross was made of gold with inset cloisonne, a design familiar to anyone who's seen the artefacts found in Sutton Hoo or the Staffordshire Hoard, all of which point to the incredible wealth that circulated among the Anglo-Saxon nobility. The vestments were placed in the coffin during the 10th century by King Athelstan as a sign of his respect for the community of Cuthbert, after he finally liberated Northumbria from the Danes and permanently absorbed it into the Kingdom of England. But we'll talk a lot more about that in the future. Both Hild and Cuthbert, while hugely important figures, had little direct influence on the Northumbrian Golden Age, their influence came more from establishing the general religious culture of Northumbria, out of which the Northumbrian Golden Age emerged. The fourth figure I want to discuss today, in contrast, personally laid the foundation for the Golden Age, and did more than many others to create a distinctly Romanesque church in Anglo-Saxon England, 
which would go on to influence Christian learning and architecture throughout the island. This man was called Benedict Bishop. Benedict, unsurprisingly at this point, also came from a noble background, and was, we are told by Bede, his biographer, Theng of King Oswiu. He was also a friend of Wilfred. This friendship points to Benedict's attraction to the Roman way of doing things from a quite an early stage in his life. Throughout his life, he travelled to Rome many times, more times than most Anglo-Saxons ever did, and it was during the second such trip that he became enamoured with the Benedictine way of monasticism when he stopped on his way back at the Benedictine monastery of Lorin. It was at that monastery that he became a Benedictine monk, and he stayed there for two years, before again travelling to Rome. It was at this time that King Egbert of Kent sent a priest named Wighaird to Rome to be crowned Archbishop of Canterbury, but Wighaird died in Rome. Pope Vitalian then chose Theodore of Tarsus to go in his place and entrusted him to Benedict, who would serve as a guide and an interpreter. Theodore became Archbishop of Canterbury in 669, and he made Benedict Abbot of St. Peter and Paul Monastery in Canterbury. He was abbot there for two years before deciding to move on. We are told that he was a friend of King Kenwal of Wessex, and would have gone to Wessex, but that Kenwal died suddenly, at which point Benedict went back to his native Northumbria. In 674, Benedict, who seemingly had become quite close with King Edgefrith, was given land near the mouth of the river Weir to build a monastery. It was here that he built his monastery of Monk Wearmouth. Benedict, we're told, commissioned continental masons and glaziers to design the monastery in a Roman style akin to that that he had seen on his many trips to Rome. B tells us that the arts of Romanesque masonry and stained glass making were unknown in England at this time, and that Benedict's monastery of Monk Wearmouth introduced them back into England. Archaeology has yielded up evidence to suggest that this is actually true. For example, there is evidence of a stained glass workshop at Monk Wearmouth, from which the knowledge seems to have spread. On it, as an interesting side note, if you go to Monk Wearmouth Abbey today, in the chancel you'll see a small, round stained glass window. This is actually the oldest stained glass window in the world, and it was built several decades ago, using fragments from the ruined abbey which date from around the year 675. Bede also gives us a description of the inside of the church at Monk Wearmouth, and he tells us that Benedict had the inside walls painted with various murals depicting scenes from the Gospels, with the intention that they would inform and edify the people who came to the church who perhaps wouldn't be able to actually read or to understand Latin. This is another innovation in Anglo-Saxon England, at least as far as we know, because it's the first reference we have to images being painted inside a church. In 679, Benedict again returned to Rome, this time to get books for his new community. He also brought back relics, as well as cantors to teach the monks of Monk Wearmouth the Roman chant. His vision, like that of Theodore, was clearly to inject continental practice and orthodoxy into the English church. Benedict did this through books and practices that were gifted to Monk Wearmouth Jarrow, and through the rule that he created for the community, which was seemingly based mostly on the rule of St. Benedict, but with additions inspired by various monasteries Benedict had visited in his many trips to the continent. Edgefrith was apparently so pleased with the results that ten years later he gave Benedict more resources to found a second monastery at Jarrow. Although the two monasteries were not particularly close to each other, they were administratively and generally understood to be two parts of a single community, which is referred to as Monk Wearmouth Jarrow. This community was in many ways the model for the future of English monasticism, and it quickly eclipsed places like Lindisfarne and Whitby as an intellectual centre, and along with York, was the hub for the Northumbrian Golden Age. Benedict died in the year 690, but he was still abbot in 680, when a seven-year-old boy from a family who lived on land owned by Monk Wearmouth Jarrow entered service at the monastery. The boy's name was Bede, and he would go on to become probably the most important Anglo-Saxon of them all. But we'll talk more about his life and his work and why he's so important in the next episode. 
thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I've been your host, Tom Kearns, and it's a pleasure to be back with you. If you enjoyed this or if you've enjoyed previous episodes, I ask that you please leave a review or a like or a star rating or whatever, depending on what system you use, where you found it. It helps to get more visibility and helps us to get the, get the word out there about the podcast. There is also now a Facebook group, um, which you can find by typing the name of the podcast into, into Facebook. So if you are at all interested, feel free to drop a like there. You should get notifications about when new episodes are uploaded. But that's all for now. So thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast.